Episode 1, The Hated Classmate Akane Nishino starts her day off like any high school student. She gets ready for school with luxury, of course, given her personal driver. At school, she's met with warm greetings, except for one person, Minoru Kagano, and it's not just because he can't seem to remember her name. No, Akane has a deeper issue with him. He never truly sees her. Here's where things get intriguing. Akane, once in the limelight, now wears a mask. Ever since a scandal rocked her life, she's been playing roles, the teacher's pet and the popular girl. But one day, her illusion of safety shatters. Her driver is MIA and she's forced to walk home. Suddenly, she's kidnapped. Lucky for her, though, there is someone looming in the background. It's none other than Kagano. Trapped in a warehouse, the kidnappers have big plans for the heiress of the Nishino Empire. But they certainly didn't plan for this. Enter the stylish ruffian slayer. The kidnappers, one with military training, is no match for Kagano and his crowbar. Akane's rescued and it's back to school for her. The next day, a simple greeting from Kaganu makes her realize that perhaps he's been wearing a mask too. But just as things get interesting, tragedy strikes. Kagano's gone. Always dreaming of heroism, Kagano struggled in a world where he just didn't belong. But fate has a twist. Reborn in a new world, with magic, he's ready to rise as the eminence in shadow, changing the fates of many. Episode 2, Shadow Garden is Born. Dive into the complex world where Sid, once known as Minoru Kagano in a previous life, discovers the ancient cult of Diablos, courtesy of a report from Alpha. Born anew, Sid's not just your average aristocratic kid. He's got magic in his veins, courtesy of the Kagano family legacy of Dark Knights. By day, he's a silent background character. However, by night, he's out battling bandits. One discovery leads him to a shocking revelation. This creature, overloaded with magic, transforms into an elf. Sid, a man seemingly always prepared, has a plan. Explaining a tale of heroes, curses, and demon lords, Sid recruits this elf. Without a name of her own, Sid names her Alpha, bringing her into his grand scheme against the long-forgotten cult of Diablos. Time flies. Three years, to be exact. Sid is at the cusp of adolescence and his beloved sister Claire is poised to enter the Midgar Academy for Dark Knights. But disaster strikes. Claire's gone. Kidnapped by the very cult Sid fictitiously created. With Alpha and Beta by his side and a not-so-accurate map, Sid rallies the Seven Shadows. Their mission? Rescue Claire. Viscount Grease, a cunning cult member, underestimates Claire's resilience. Additionally, Claire's got some tricks up her sleeve. As the Seven Shadows slice through the cultists, it becomes evident this is a war of shadows. A pill-popping, power-enhancing Grease challenges Shadow. But is raw power enough to defeat strategy and skill? The answer is an overwhelming no. Shadow reminds us of the abyss that lies within, diving deeper into the darkness and emerging triumphant. With Claire safe, it's back to the norm, or so it seems. Alpha drops a bombshell that might change the course of Sid's journey. Episode 3, Fencer Ordinaire. Alpha reveals that the cult of Diablos isn't just a simple cult, but a massive organization that stretches across the globe. The girls decide to part ways with Sid, a sign of maturity and independence. At 15, Sid steps into the corridors of the same academy where his sister studies in the royal capital. But instead of glory, Sid slips into the shadows, finding kinship with fellow underdogs Skell Etal and Potato. With Sid's recent blunder in an academy test, he's given a peculiar dare, confess to the school's crown jewel, Princess Alexia, and face inevitable heartbreak. But in a twist of fate, Alexia's response to Sid isn't what anyone expected. Suddenly, Sid's once invisible life is thrust into the spotlight. Surprising friendships form, and as Alexia delves into the world of the lower nobles, it's Sid's peculiar habits that capture her attention. A shared interest in royal bush and fencing further binds them, leading Sid to the elite section one of the fencing team. On the surface, it's about fencing, but behind every move and parry, deeper stories unfold. Tensions rise as the Academy's fencing instructor, Zenon Griffey, looms over their budding relationship, a reminder of Alexia's marriage obligations. Sid's detective senses kick in. Alexia's affection might not be genuine love, but a clever ruse to escape a preordained future with Zenon. A game of manipulation, gold coins, and a desperate need for freedom sets the stage. As the duo continues their public charade, the lines between reality and play blur. The enigmatic Xenon becomes a frequent topic of discussion, with his seemingly flawless exterior raising suspicions. In a heart-to-heart -heart on a train ride, Alexia unveils her vulnerabilities, her quest for validation, and the shadow of her more talented sister. 
Sid, ever the enigma, reveals a glimpse of his own philosophy, leading to heightened emotions. Just when it seems the riddles of their relationship will unravel, Alexia exits, leaving Sid to contemplate the end of their unexpected liaison. Amidst apologies and banter, danger lurks. As the Academy's gates loom ahead, Xenon and his entourage confront Sid. With Alexia missing and fingers pointing at him, Sid's shadowy Academy life faces its most challenging trial yet. Episode 4, Sadism's Reward. In a chilling twist, Princess Alexia awakens, trapped and tethered. She's not alone. A monstrous presence lurks nearby. The reason for her capture? A dark secret concealed in her very blood, a catalyst to resurrect ancient demons. Parallel to Alexia's nightmare, Sid's ordeal takes a peculiar turn. Thrust into an all-too-familiar interrogation scene, he seizes the moment, reveling in his role as the classic minor character. His over-the-top performance, however, doesn't appease his tormentors. As days roll on, doubts emerge. Zenon and Iris ponder Sid's innocence. With inconclusive evidence and faith in Sid's limited capabilities, Iris opts for his release, albeit under a watchful eye. The Academy's walls buzz with rumors and alliances. Claire, steadfast in her defense of Sid, faces resistance from fellow students. Rose, ever the voice of reason, intervenes, ensuring things don't escalate further. Home sweet home. For Sid, homecoming brings not just solace, but revelations. Alpha, always in the loop, offers insights into the cult's motives behind Alexia's abduction. Loyalties remain intact as Alpha even contemplates revenge for Sid's unjust treatment. Within the confines of his secret chamber, Sid unveils his stash of rare treasures. An assembly is in motion. As Beta briefs Sid on their grand plan, an unexpected twist emerges. Sid, ever the strategist, swaps roles with Delta for their impending assault. But danger lurks even in familiar alleys. An ambush awaits Sid, where deceit and treachery rear their ugly heads. Unfazed, Sid demonstrates the full extent of his capabilities, turning the tables on his assailants. As chaos ensues, desperation grips the facility holding Alexia. A mad scientist, driven by ambition, resorts to his last-ditch effort. But the very creation meant to be his magnum opus turns on him. Lost in the labyrinthine facility, Alexia faces an unexpected revelation. Xenon's deep-seated ambitions come to the fore. The struggle for power, prestige, and positions unfurls, culminating in an intense face-off. But just as all seems lost, a new enigmatic figure enters the fray, introducing himself as Shadow. Episode 5, I Am. Xenon, quick to underestimate, soon finds himself cornered, outmatched by the enigmatic adversary's uncanny swordsmanship. Above ground, chaos reigns. A monstrosity unleashed, healing faster than the knights can wound. But Iris, with steely resolve, attempts to dice the creature to its end. Yet, in this dance of blades, enters Alpha, revealing the creature's tragic past and putting it to rest. Meanwhile, Xenon's desperation grows. A red pill promises power beyond human limits. Transformed into the Third Awakened, he unleashes a newfound fury. Even in a transformed form, Xenon is no match for Shadow. Shadow, now bored with the fight, unveils his philosophy of power, culminating in a catastrophic explosion, equivalent to an atomic bomb, that quite literally reshapes the heart of the city. From the devastation, Alexia emerges, unscathed and reinvigorated. An embrace from Iris seals the bond of sisterhood. The facade of their relationship, now shattered by Xenon's demise, reveals deeper feelings. But Sid turns her down flat, and a sudden turn of events leaves behind a mystery that would confound generations. The ladies of Shadow Garden, elated by Shadow's show of power, set their sights on future missions. But amidst their triumphs, an impersonator emerges. Iris, now wary of the Knight's Order, forms a covert team with trusty allies Glenn and Marco. Their mission? Decode a mysterious artifact. Yet amidst these somber undertones, a chance encounter sees Sherry Barnett crossing paths with a blood-soaked Sid. Episode 6, Pretenders. Sid's relationship woes lead Skell and Poe to introduce him to the world's best consolation prize, chocolate. But little did they know, this journey would offer more than just sweet treats. Deep within the kingdom's secrets, Iris seeks the genius of Sherry Barnett to decode a mysterious artifact. With the shadow of the cult looming large, every clue matters, and Iris, not taking any chances, enlists the newly formed Crimson Order for protection. Sid's trip takes a twist, as he finds himself in a familiar yet alien world, curated by none other than Gamma. Revelations abound, 
from Gamma's entrepreneurial ventures to the truth about a shadowy imposter. Sid, ever the opportunist, never leaves empty-handed. In shadowy lanes, danger lurks. Alexia confronts men posing as Shadow Garden members. But Shadow, the real one, intervenes, leaving no stone unturned to protect his identity. Yet with every battle, new mysteries unfold. What are these imposters truly after? Alexia and Iris grapple with their uncertainties, pondering over the true enemy. Yet for Iris, any force that threatens the kingdom is an adversary. Amidst all this chaos, school remains an uncharted territory for Sid. Skell and Poe's attempts at romance go hilariously awry. As for Sid, he finds an unexpected recipient for his chocolate, the genius Sherry Barnett. Gifts, deciphering their meaning, young Sherry dives deep into her emotions, aided by a father's wise counsel. But like all treasures, their moment is fleeting, a reminder that time waits for no one. Episode 7, a fencing tournament of intrigue and bloodshed. Amidst the bustling capital, Sherry stands at the crossroads of young love. With a piece of chocolate, she embarks on a delightful journey of the heart. Secrets and shadows abound as new unveils troubling news to Sid. The insidious reach of a first child wrecks, but Sid's mind wanders elsewhere to an unexpected challenge that awaits him. As blades clash and sparks fly, the fencing tournament reveals more than just skill. Claire's triumphant bout sets the stage for an unforgettable duel, the indomitable Oriana versus our quirky Sid. With pride and 48 techniques at his side, Sid's comical antics shock and amuse the audience. Each fall, each audacious claim, he remains unyielding, challenging the very spirit of Oriana. Valor meets discretion as the duel ends. But for Sid, his spirit remains unbroken, hoping for another day under the spotlight. Outside the arena, Sherry finds inspiration in Sid's resilience. A simple token of gratitude, baked cookies, forges a budding connection. But as their worlds intertwine, Sid senses the complexities of mingling with royalty. Torn between duty and her heart, Sherry seeks counsel. Alexia's revelation becomes a bittersweet pill, sowing seeds of hope for Sherry but despair for Alexia. Five days pass, and as Sid returns, an air of benevolence surrounds him. Yet the impending student council elections are overshadowed by a more sinister event. A barrier, unseen to most but felt by Sid. The school, once a haven of learning, is trapped in a vice grip. When fake shadows descend, revealing their ominous intent, magic becomes their plaything. As adversaries mock and magic fails, Sid's relentless spirit shines once more. In a moment of truth, he makes the ultimate sacrifice. Episode 8, Dark Knight Academy Under Attack. The Academy stands on the precipice of darkness. Amidst chaos, Sid, our enigmatic protagonist, rises as a true hero. He bravely leaps in front of the attack directed at Rose. His sacrifice leaves Rose to ponder Sid's gallant act. While the auditorium becomes a cage for the innocent, outside its walls, the battle of wits ensues. In the clutches of death, Sid employs a secret technique, a testament to his tenacity, allowing him to walk away from what seemed like a fatal wound. As the Academy's walls echo with terror, Rex, the ambiguous agent, confronts Sherry. Glenn and Marco's fierce stand allows Sherry a chance of escape. Sherry is being chased by the goons. Luckily, Sid is able to intervene, ensuring Sherry's safety. Amidst the turmoil, an unsettling revelation emerges. The Eye of Avarice, a magical time bomb, threatens all within the Academy. Sherry, with an ancestral artifact, becomes the Academy's last hope. Ambitions and threats entwine as Rex finds himself under pressure. The knight's aspirations lead to a dangerous game. Dancing within the trap, Sid showcases his unparalleled skills. Rex, cornered, realizes the true might of his opponent. Nu, amidst her quest, uncovers a grim sight. With Marco's fallen state, ties of betrothal and duty weigh heavy. Alliances form as Sid and Nu, two powerhouses, strategize. An artifact's manipulation becomes their key to salvation. In the race against time, Sherry works meticulously. Nu's actions, shrouded in enigma, hint at a future confrontation. Episode 9, The End of a Lie. Magicless and vulnerable, Iris stands outside the Academy's walls. As Sherry preps her artifact for the tunnels, memories of her mother's tragic end and Lutheran's comforting embrace emerge. With a debt to repay and resolve in her heart, Sherry ventures solo into the depths. Meanwhile, the cult knight grows restless. As the terrorists begin a heinous spree, Rose warns students of their vulnerability. Sherry activates the artifact, freeing the students' abilities. With renewed strength, students and the Shadow Garden descend, combat ensuing. 
However, victory is bittersweet. The school is engulfed in flames, a trail of destruction left behind. An unexpected revelation ensues. Lutheran, once a protector, now the cult knight. His tale? A desperate quest for power and a tragic betrayal. As Sid faces Lutheran, their duel ends swiftly, but Shadow's entrance changes the tide. Unleashing the eye of avarice, Lutheran's newfound might is still no match for Shadow's prowess. The weight of her loss compounding, Sherry mourns Lutheran, oblivious to his dark deeds. Now marked as the kingdom's enemy, Shadow's deeds place a target on his back. As Gamma and Alpha reflect on Shadow's ominous words, Alpha calls upon the Seven Shadows. The Academy's gates close early for summer and farewells are in order. Sherry's decision? Study abroad. A heartfelt exchange with Sid ensues, her mysterious intent concealed as a secret. Episode 10, The Sacred Land, City of Deception. Summer has called most students home, leaving the dorms eerily silent. Sid decides to stay, but soon finds himself drowning in boredom. Luckily, a letter from Alpha directs his attention towards Lindworm, the Sacred Land. Epsilon's morning blooms with nostalgia, as she dives into the memories of her rescue by Shadow and her unexpected gift of slime magic, changing her physique. While Beta crafts a tale of Shadow's heroics, frustration takes hold. She seeks the refreshing embrace of the outdoors. There, a conversation about Shadow's wandering gaze brews between Beta and Epsilon, only to be interrupted by news news from Alpha. Elsewhere, the princess Alexia and her guardian Iris visit Gamma's store, a daring choice of lingerie for Alexia, which leaves Iris red-faced. A flashback to the incident at the school. News of Sid's survival brings Rose rushing. Misreading his heroics, she proclaims a love-filled future while Sid seems lost in a different interpretation. As the train speeds toward the sacred lands, Rose clings and dreams. Sid, however, second-guesses this slower choice of travel. Lindworm offers tales and legends of a demon's severed arm and a signing event that reveals a familiar face. As Sid discovers Beta's pen name, Natsume, the line between originality and plagiarism blurs. As Rose marvels at the written word, Sid deciphers a message in ancient script. In the hallowed cathedral, a grim sight, Archbishop Drake, lifeless. Sid's pursuit of a shadowy figure ends when Epsilon's timely entrance spells doom for the enemy. With whispers of the cult and a plan in motion, Sid announces his next move. Episode 11, The Goddess's Trial. Sid, a lover of relaxation, finds himself in a hot spring, but the tranquility is interrupted by an unexpected face, Alexia. With both there for the awaited goddess's trial, we delve into its details. Ancient warriors, grand battles, and the sought-after title only the most worthy contenders can claim. Contrary to Alexia's assumptions, Sid's spa etiquette is nothing but polite. Their playful banter takes a turn when the topic shifts to Excalibur. As Sid departs, a flustered Alexia is left pondering his cryptic remark. Meanwhile, the church deals with internal turmoil. With the Archbishop's death, investigations ensue. Alexia's is quite literally asked to take a back seat. The goddess's trial commences. With each contender aiming for glory, the stakes rise. Yet ancient warriors remain elusive. Victory offers prestige, but there's a catch. Only the most powerful earn a warrior's respect. A sudden spotlight and a swift move. Sid morphs into Shadow, taking center stage. To everyone's astonishment, Aurora, the Witch of Calamity, emerges, a representation of Shadow's true power. The gravity of the match is clear. Two titans, equally matched. Their fierce battle ensues. Shadow's strategy, a mix of observation and swift action, overwhelms Aurora. The arena is left astounded. And just when you thought it was over, another mystery unveils. A magic door standing tall, promising even more surprises. Episode 12, The Truth Within the Memories. Sid thinks he's shaken off the spotlight, but a relentless magic door tells another story. With no choice, he ventures in, entering the unknown. Meanwhile, in the arena, doors are materializing. Nelson recognizes this occurrence as a rare mark of honor, but the situation escalates. The trial is abruptly halted. To everyone's surprise, Alpha, Epsilon, and other Shadow Garden members appear. Confident in the situation, Shadow Garden enters the magical door as well. Alexia and Rose hastily follow them in. History unravels as Alpha unveils the past. The tale of Olivier the hero emerges, her struggles, her sacrifice, and a shocking resemblance to Alpha. Parallel to the girl's journey, Sid encounters Aurora again. Their shared goal to escape this magical prison forms an unlikely alliance. The realm's nature is uncovered, a place of haunting memories. 
As the group navigates through the memories, revelations pour in, a dark past of the cult's persistent pursuit of power. Alpha's investigation brings light to the beads of Diablos, the source of the cult's power. As pieces fit together, Nelson's true identity is revealed. But just when you think you've seen it all, a showdown looms ahead. Episode 13, a bloody showdown as an offering to annihilation. As Delta carves through Nelson's clones, an alarming revelation is made. Proximity to the sanctuary center both weakens them and empowers Nelson. Meanwhile, Sid and Aurora navigate through a chilling memory of war, the dead rising to challenge their resolve. Epsilon's group uncovers dark truths about the possessed, safeguarding them with a quick snapshot. Fighting their way through the nightmare, Sid makes a decisive move to shatter the memory, leading them to the heart of the sanctuary. Delta continues to astonish, her unparalleled might against Nelson leaving him reeling. In the center, Sid and Aurora face a locked door and a fabled sword that only a chosen one can wield. But as they ponder their predicament, the world outside remains tumultuous. Alexia observes the vast difference in Delta's combat style compared to Shadow's, while Alpha wraps up their mission, vowing to return. Left in the aftermath, Nelson plots a new narrative for his peers, but a surprise alert redirects his attention to the Sanctuary's heart. Face to face with the legendary Olivier, Sid finds himself in a fierce duel, a broken sword, a relentless adversary, and the mysterious smile of a fighter. The fight culminates in a suspenseful climax as Olivier lands a critical blow and Sid unveils a hidden trump card. Episode 14, Your Lie, Your Wish. Just when we thought the end was near, Sid fights back with a surprising and lethal move against Olivier. But, in the heart of the sanctuary, Nelson doesn't hold back, summoning a legion of Olivier clones to finish Sid off. Sid unveils his hidden ace, battling Nelson's clones with unmatched magic power, an ultimate spell with an explosive finale. The sanctuary shatters in the wake of Sid's raw power. In the hushed aftermath, Sid and Aurora share a moment. Secrets revealed, promises made, and a farewell that hints at a mysterious future encounter. Rising from the ashes, Alexia, fueled by a newfound drive, lays the foundation of an ambitious new organization with allies Rose and Beta. Epsilon updates Alpha on the obliterated sanctuary, a vaporized holy sword, and the intriguing links to the demon Diablos. Meanwhile, in the bustling city of Madlid, Gamma's eyes are set on grand redevelopment plans, ensuring her mark in Velgalta Empire's history. We get a nostalgic glimpse into the past, where Alpha and Sid lay the groundwork for the challenges ahead, while in the present, the impending visit of the Royal Chancellor looms over Midgar. As Alexia and Iris delve into the mysteries of the divine teachings, Iris plots her own course for influence through the Bushin Festival. As the episode closes, darkness looms. Rose, in the midst of training, faces a sinister surprise. Episode 15, The Strongest, Weakest Man. As the world's elite warriors gather for the Bushin Festival, Sid has a rather mischievous plan up his sleeve. With Gamma's expertise, Sid undergoes a transformative makeover to become Mundane Man, the embodiment of mediocrity. Anna Rose, a skilled warrior, warns Mundane to back off while Quentin's brute force tests just how convincing Sid's disguise really is. But even as punches fly, Sid's cunning shines through, leaving everyone, including Anna Rose, second-guessing their first impressions. Amidst the festival's chaos, Sid and Rose share a touching moment. Rose's past, her nightly aspirations, and her upcoming engagement to the notorious perv Ashat take center stage. The festival is more than just fights, as Skell introduces the lucrative world of betting. But while Skell is focused on maximizing his odds, Goldo's analytical skills reveal a deeper understanding of the battles to come. And as the ring heats up, the unexpected happens. Goldo's analytical prowess meets a surprising hiccup as the seemingly weak mundane man takes down his mighty opponent in a blink of an eye. As dawn breaks, shocking news greets Sid and Skell. Rose's defiance takes a dangerous turn, plunging our story into even deeper intrigue. Episode 16 unseen intentions. In the political quagmire of Rose's actions, Oriana Kingdom seeks justice on its own terms. But loyal Alexia is on a quest for the truth, hoping to give Rose a voice amidst the turmoil. As the kingdom's politics rage on, Sid maintains his composure, even as the ethereal Beatrix poses a surprising query. Inside the Bushin Festival's ring, mystery and speculations mount. Goldo's surefire win is thrown into chaos by Mundane's uncanny and seemingly coincidental reflexes. 
As Anna Rose deciphers Mundane's surprising moves, the Bushin Festival audience is left in awe. Is Mundane a mastermind or just blessed with unbelievable luck? Quentin's resolve hardens, anticipating a showdown with Mundane. A perceptive Anna Rose, a warrior who believes she's unraveled his tricks, faces Mundane. With weights shed and intentions clear, their match is sure to be a nail-biter. Episode 17. The Moonlight That Pierces the Darkness as Skell tempts Sid with promises of riches, familiar notes of a piano pull Sid into a memory lane of his former life. The familiar tune of the Moonlight Sonata stirs questions in Sid's mind. Is this world hiding more secrets, or is another reincarnated soul nearby? Epsilon, basking in the applause, reveals her rise to fame, but Sid's nostalgic smile at the piano hints at something deeper. The tunnels underneath the royal capital brim with suspense. Alexia and Beta embark on a quest, chasing whispers of the cult's involvement in Rose's disappearance. For Rose, the weight of her choices presses down. Haunted by past actions and threats from Perv, she grapples with a looming shadow of war. But music proves to be a siren call, guiding Rose towards the mysterious shadow. Their exchange touches on desire, power, and the essence of true strength. Rose ultimately emerges more formidable than ever. In a whirlwind of emotions, alliances are tested, and the very fabric of trust is stretched thin. As the day draws to a close, Sid returns home, but an unexpected guest still awaits. Episode 18, Betting on a Moment. A brotherly love? Hardly. Claire's growing impatience with Sid reaches its peak, yet she gifts him a surprise, a hyper VIP ticket to the festival. What should be a treat quickly becomes a spotlight for Sid. Sat beside Iris Midgar, the murmurs of the crowd hint at trouble. Mundane man. The mysterious, unassuming contender has everyone buzzing. But for Sid, the joy lies in seeing his creation gaining the reputation he envisioned. A past connection resurfaces as Beatrix, the elusive elf, makes her presence known. But with burgers exchanged, it's hard to tell if this is a reunion or a reconnaissance. Meanwhile, in the arena, tensions rise. Perv Ashat's interest in Anna Rose makes it clear that the battles are about more than just prowess. Anna Rose, a master in her own right, meets her match. Mundane man's unexpected skill has everyone second-guessing. From after images to dodges, it's a dance of blades and wits. Perv's suspicions grow, hinting at political intrigue beneath the martial spectacle. And as Anna Rose humbly acknowledges her defeat, it's clear mundane man is a force to be reckoned with. But Sid's scheming mind is always at work. Should he vanish after victory or embrace the darker path of an assassin? Just when Sid thinks he can rest, Claire makes her presence felt yet again. Episode 19, Dancing Puppet. Memories dance through Iris's mind, a young child, a victor, and now a beacon against the divine teachings. Some VIP seats aren't about the view. For Sid, it's luxury on demand, all the while enjoying a lesson in coffee with Iris. But the festival's calm is shattered by the entrance of a legend, Beatrix, and her interest? Not the competitors, but her missing niece. In the shadows, Perv's sinister plot unravels. With a drugged King Oriana in tow, he's playing a dangerous Game of Thrones with stakes higher than ever. Claire shines in her moment, but the main event awaits. Iris versus Mundane Man. Fear grips Iris, not from Mundane's blade, but his eyes. A psychological warfare where the arena itself becomes a threat. Yet the real battle lies beyond the arena. As Rose approaches the VIP seating, a trail of fallen adversaries marks her path. Shadow Garden's presence looms. Back in the arena, Mundane's victory is swift and absolute. But Beatrix's challenge promises another electrifying bout. Heartbreak and resolution converge. Rose's reunion with her father is marred by tragedy. Perv's puppeteering reaches its cruel peak. From the shadows emerges a familiar figure. Mundane sheds his guise to reveal Shadow. But Beatrix isn't one to back down. As blades clash and Perv flees, the episode leaves us hanging between past revelations and the promise of an explosive showdown. Season 1 Finale, Episode 20, Advent of the Demon. Mundane man is Shadow. The revelation hits Iris like a ton of bricks. The pieces finally make sense, and now Shadow is right in front of her. The battle is fierce, taking the whole stadium by storm, and King Midgar is informed it may even spill into the streets. With King Oriana now deceased, Perv makes a desperate dash for the Oriana kingdom. On the streets, Beatrix and Shadow lock in combat. But Iris, determined not to stand by, jumps into the fray with a blade of legend. Buildings, trains, and even rivers become their battleground. But as Iris and Beatrix push, 
Shadow pulls out a nostalgic friend. Away from the chaos, Rose grapples with her choices until Alpha presents the opportunity to join Shadow Garden. Back in the city, the stakes escalate. Shadow's dark magic envelops the capital. The kingdom's pulse quickens with fear. In the midst of this chaos, Princess Alexia remains unfazed, dedicated to her training and her sword. Shadow's onslaught seems unstoppable, and just as he's about to conjure his atomic attack, he vanishes. The weight of the moment crashes down on Iris, as she realizes she might as well have been powerless against Shadow. News of the demon Shadow's battle with Iris and Beatrix spreads like wildfire. Beatrix, with her mission unfulfilled, exits with a heavy heart. A journey deep into the woods leads Rose to an ancient city, the heart of Shadow Garden. Here, she's stripped of her past and thrust into the role of a soldier. While deep underground, Shadow finds solace in the keys of a piano, reflecting on the chessboard of fate he's manipulating. In the mysterious Wallace City, a realm shrouded in shadows and governed by three formidable monarchs, Kainu and the Shadow Garden team embark on a perilous journey under the haunting radiance of a crimson moon. The center of attention is the enigmatic Blood Queen, a vampire who has been dormant for far too long. Anticipation builds for a climactic confrontation as the countdown to a reawakening ticks down. The episode opens with Delta ascending a peak and releasing a powerful howl into the heavens. Meanwhile, Beta reveals to the Seven Shades and MC the existence of the Diabolus cult, whose eerie silence is causing turmoil among various factions, and the halted reorganization of the Fen. Gamma and Epsilon express satisfaction with the current focus on the Oriana Kingdom, but AA and Zeta voice concerns over the escalating troubles in the chaotic Lawless City, a den of evil exploited by corrupt forces. Gamma proposes shifting their attention to Lawless City, but MC interrupts, sensing an impending bloodstorm over the city, coinciding with the rise of the Red Moon. The organization's members grow anxious, urging action to quell the unrest. Decisively, MC resolves to personally address the turmoil in Lawless City, braving the impending chaos despite the Seven Shadows' reservations. Suddenly, the scene shifts to a bound woman lying on the ground. Alpha commends MC, and the Seven Shadows kneel in reverence, wishing him well on his quest. Beta feverishly records portents of the Blood Queen's revival, consumed by a sense of urgency. Privately, MC admires the improvisational prowess of the Seven Shadows and remains unfazed by the Red Moon's significance. The narrative then follows two individuals venturing into Lawless City to pursue the Blood Queen, discussing the fearsome Crimson Tower and the city's terror of the Vampire's Castle. A menacing figure, chained and with a severed arm, scoffs at their naivety, revealing his past encounter with the Blood Queen and his former notoriety as the White Devil. Unimpressed, the duo continues to boast of their strength, prompting the White Devil to demonstrate his power, narrowly sparing their lives. He later sells them as pets in a market. MC, dragged through Lawless City by his sister CLA, finds the city's degradation oddly satisfying. CLA leads him to the Association Building, bypassing the Crimson Tower. MC reminisces about his previous life as Minoru Kino, who tragically died and was reborn in this new world. He reflects on CLA's fierce nature, her triumph in a tournament, and her subsequent move to Lawless City to hunt vampires, inadvertently involving MC and her plans. He realizes that accompanying CLA might secure him a government position after graduation. Their sibling conversation is interrupted by a pet shop owner showcasing newly acquired pets. In the chaotic heart of the Wallless City, MC recognizes two men sold as pets, they are the same duo previously defeated by the White Devil. While CLA dismisses these pets as unimportant and departs, MC finds himself lost and wandering the city streets. He soon encounters a group assaulting a ghoul. Abruptly, under the influence of a blood-red moon and a surge of magical energy, the situation escalates. The beaten ghoul becomes aggressive, its victims transforming into zombies and spreading chaos. MC, a witness to this mayhem, realizes that the legends of the Red Moon's effect are true. Opting to remain inconspicuous, he avoids heroics, but his strategy changes when Mary, a legendary vampire hunter, intervenes to save him from the zombie outbreak. Mimicking Mary, MC adopts the mannerisms and speech of a protagonist he's destined to become. Elsewhere, Claire becomes alarmed upon realizing MC is missing amid the vampire-infested turmoil. Meanwhile, P and Skelly, naively exploring a district of ill repute, find themselves fleeing from the undead. In the midst of this, a weary prostitute named Marie is startled by the chaos outside. Her life takes a turn when Shadow, echoing Mary's earlier words, rescues her from a zombie. Marie's perception of Shadow, contrary to her friend's warning of an evil Shadow, is one of gratitude. The narrative shifts to Lady Yukon, contemplating alone until she's informed of the worsening situation. Claire, grieving MC's assumed demise and unaware of his actual predicament in the Crimson Tower, meets Mary. Together, they set out to confront the looming threat. As Juggernaut revels in the city's destruction, the director despairs at the sight. Shadow emerges as a savior amidst the chaos, battling the ghouls. Meanwhile, preparations to use MC as a sacrifice for awakening the Blood Queen, Elizabeth, are nearly complete in the Crimson Tower. Crimson Selma is irked by Yukim and Juggernaut's interference in his plans. Shadow, secretly observing from above, sees Juggernaut attacking Yukim. Refusing to abandon his aspirations, Shadow leaps into action, delivering a theatrical monologue. As B-Warrior rampages towards the royal capital castle, his joy in the slaughter is palpable. 
However, his triumph is short-lived when a red-haired individual unexpectedly severs his arm, turning his moment of victory into a shocking defeat. This abrupt reversal serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of his reckless actions, leaving him imprisoned in the royal castle. In the heart of the chaos, the insatiable urge to kill humans consumes the chained warrior, his desire to wreak havoc barely contained. As time passes, the situation worsens with ghouls overrunning numerous towns. The tyrant, a formidable figure and captain of the Black Tower, emerges, showcasing his strength by eliminating ghouls. The chained warrior watches enviously as the tyrant displays his prowess. The battlefield then witnesses the arrival of Spirit the Fox, the renowned warrior of the White Tower. Her strength, rumored to surpass the tyrants, becomes evident as she engages him in combat. However, their intense fight is abruptly halted by the intervention of Shadow, a mysterious warrior known for his prowess in the dark. His arrival signals a significant turning point, as he believes the Red Moon's rise heralds the onset of greater horrors. As Shadow departs, the chained warrior underestimates him, perceiving a lack of energy and presuming weakness. Seizing the opportunity to fulfill his bloodlust, he attacks Shadow, only to be swiftly bisected. Shadow's exit is marked by a warning of the Red Moon's ominous implications. Elsewhere, Alpha is deep in research within the Royal Library, investigating the connection between vampires and the possessed, searching for clues to support her theory. Her focus is interrupted by the arrival of Claire and Mary, who are on a mission to save Claire's brother. Alpha, familiar with their identities, offers insights into her findings, suggesting a link between vampires and the possessed. Claire's urgent query about a possible cure for the possessed is met with ambiguity, heightening the tension. As Claire and Mary prepare to leave, Alpha's cryptic remark about experiencing Haven again visibly disturbs Mary, sparking Claire's curiosity. Despite her questions, Mary remains tight-lipped, troubled by how Alpha could know about Haven. Claire senses Mary's inner conflict but chooses not to delve deeper into her secrets. Advancing towards their goal, Claire and Mary encounter the tyrant, now engaged in a fierce battle against the elite vampires of the royal castle. His ease in dispatching them impresses Claire, who deems him remarkably powerful. Mary, recognizing the tyrant's strength, advises against confrontation. Their attempt to leave unnoticed fails as the tyrant swiftly detects and confronts them, knocking Claire aside. Mary steps in to assist, faced with the daunting task of contending with the formidable tyrant. In the heated battle, Mary suffers a swift defeat at the hands of the tyrant, only to be miraculously revived by drinking Claire's blood through an unconventional kiss. This act imbues Mary with extraordinary strength, elevating her to a level akin to a Super Saiyan. Engaging the tyrant in combat, she finds herself evenly matched with his immense power. However, as the tyrant prepares to strike Claire, Shadow intervenes, sending the tyrant flying out of the castle with a single, powerful kick. Shadow's sudden appearance and subsequent departure, warning of the frenzy's escalation, leave Claire and Mary in shock. Mary, feeling remorseful, promises to reveal her true nature to Claire. She explains her vampiric identity and the history of vampires, including the Blood Queen's peaceful coexistence with humans. The vampire's abstention from blood, while weakening them, allowed them to survive in sunlight. However, the Blood Queen, due to her intense need for blood, remained vulnerable to sunlight. Mary recounts the tragic fall of the vampires under the Red Moon, culminating in the Blood Queen's self-inflicted eternal slumber to avoid being used for evil. Mary's protectors were slain by Crimson, who sought to exploit the Queen's power for his own ends. As Claire empathizes with Mary's story, she reveals her own secret of being possessed and her fears of turning into a monster. The two pledge to support each other in rebuilding Haven and rescuing the Queen. Meanwhile, Shadow infiltrates the royal treasury, contemplating a leisurely life funded by stolen treasure. In contrast, Crimson implants the Queen's heart into Sid, but Shadow swiftly eliminates him. Disappointed at the lack of a formidable boss, Shadow resolves to clear out the remaining vampires and leave with the treasure if no worthy adversary appears. In a dramatic twist, a sinister flower blooms, revealing Queen Elizabeth's revival. Claire, caught off guard, is impaled by a tentacle-like appendage from the flower. As Elizabeth prepares to drain Claire's blood, Mary desperately attempts to intervene, torn between her allegiance to the Queen and her bond with Claire. In the intense battle, Alpha and her team intervene just in time to rescue Claire from Queen Elizabeth's grasp. However, despite their efforts to destroy Elizabeth, she miraculously regenerates, presenting an even greater challenge. The situation worsens as Claire's injuries prove too severe for simple first aid, and Elizabeth's power continues to grow exponentially. As Alpha and her team engage Elizabeth, Yukim observes from a distance, aware of the Queen's formidable strength. The juggernaut of the Black Power attempts to intervene with a powerful punch but to no avail, as Elizabeth's powers overwhelm everyone present. In the aftermath, the fighters, including Juggernaut and Alpha, are severely wounded, while Yukim and Mary manage to avoid major injuries. Alpha, realizing the gravity of the situation, orders 666 to evacuate Claire to safety. Amidst the chaos, Elizabeth unleashes a devastating glance attack, causing everyone's blood to clot externally, a clear indication of her control over demonic blood. Meanwhile, Claire, on the brink of death, suddenly finds herself waking up in a hospital, with Aurora at her side. Aurora reveals that Claire's possession has been cured by an unknown he. This revelation leaves Claire perplexed and desperate for answers, but Aurora offers no straightforward explanation. Instead, she delves into a discussion about evolution and adaptation, highlighting Claire's unique predicament of possessing both vampire and possessed blood, which are conflicting within her. 
As Claire's condition deteriorates, a mysterious luminescence appears on her arm, signaling a critical change. Aurora, sensing the urgency, prepares to leave, cryptically revealing that he is Shadow. This revelation shocks Claire and leaves her with more questions than answers. Back at the battle scene, Claire miraculously regains consciousness, to the astonishment of Beta, Mary, and the others. Her sudden recovery and altered appearance hinted a profound transformation, possibly linked to the intervention of Shadow and the unique interplay of her dual bloodlines. This unexpected turn of events adds a new layer of complexity to the already chaotic and mystifying situation unfolding in the battle against Queen Elizabeth. In the midst of the tumultuous battle with Queen Elizabeth, Aurora, manifesting within Claire's body, confidently confronts the Queen. She displays remarkable abilities, effortlessly deflecting Elizabeth's attack and even turning it against her. Aurora's attempt to unleash a decisive strike, however, is thwarted when her own hand and neck are damaged, revealing a limitation in Claire's body's ability to harness such immense power. Despite this setback, Aurora quickly heals herself, astonishing Beta and the others with her resilience. As the Queen seizes an opportunity to strike again, Aurora reveals that her true purpose is to buy time for Shadow's arrival. True to her word, Shadow enters the fray with a powerful blast, surprising everyone with his overwhelming presence. While Juggernaut recognizes him, the others are taken aback by the immense energy he exudes. Shadow confidently counters the Queen's attack, impressing the onlookers with his strength and skill. Beta, recognizing Shadow's intentions, vocally supports him, believing in his ability to triumph. As Shadow and Elizabeth engage in an intense aerial battle, the scene is marked by spectacular animation, captivating everyone's attention. During the fight, Shadow declares his determination to end the Queen's reign. As he introduces himself as Recovery Atomic, Mary suddenly calls out, and the environment undergoes a dramatic transformation. The red moon disappears, and the surroundings return to normalcy, leaving the citizens relieved and grateful to be alive, despite some lamenting their losses. As the city returns to peace, MC and Claire prepare to depart by train. Claire, now aware of Mary's unique abilities, expresses her concern for her. On the train, Claire confides in MC about her own special condition and the mysterious powers residing in her left hand. This revelation raises concerns about how these newfound abilities might impact her and those around her, including her brother, indicating a new chapter in their extraordinary journey. In this complex web of events, MC reassures Claire that she will successfully navigate her new challenges, promising to be by her side for support. This declaration brings comfort to Claire, affirming the bond between the siblings. Meanwhile, in a separate scenario, a high-stakes situation unfolds as three women, employees of the Mitsugi company, are cornered by bandits. The bandits, attracted by the lucrative products like coffee, taco, and tea, boast about their crimes, revealing their connection to Garter-sama, the president of the major corporate alliance, MCA. The women, initially intimidated, regain their composure when they realize the men are unaware of their true identities as members of the Shadow Garden. The bandits, caught off guard, are swiftly overpowered by the Shadow Garden, who reveal themselves in a dramatic turn of events. The Shadow Garden's intervention underlines the narrative theme of hidden strengths and identities, a recurring motif in this complex tale. Elsewhere, Skelly, and Pole, adorned in designer clothes, aim to impress with their newfound style. However, their excitement turns to dismay when they discover the clothes are cheap knockoffs. This comical interlude contrasts with the more serious developments, highlighting the varied experiences of the characters in this world. MC, reflecting on the situation, realizes the influence of Alpha's designs and marketing strategies on the capital's fashion trends. He acknowledges the cutthroat nature of business and the exploitation of individuals for profit, a thought that weighs heavily on him. Resolved to make a change, MC adopts a new identity as Mr. John Smith, the super-secret agent, and meets with Yukim in a train compartment. Yukim expresses her delight at Shadows, now John's, decision to collaborate. John, however, makes it clear that their partnership is purely transactional, hinting at the complex dynamics and relationships that define the world they navigate. This mosaic of events, from personal struggles and transformations to the underbelly of corporate dealings and the secret machinations of the Shadow Garden, paints a vivid picture of a world where appearances can be deceiving, and everyone has a role to play in the grand scheme of things. In the narrative, Yukim informs Sid about a strategic meeting Garter orchestrated, aimed at bolstering the major corporate alliance's tactics against Mitsugi in the competitive cuff market. She further elaborates on their scheme to let Mitsugi and the alliance clash, enabling them to capitalize on the fallout and reap all the gains. Yukim also warns Sid that Gon, a formidable swordsman, poses a significant obstacle in their path to confront Garter, as evidenced by a scar she reveals. Enraged, Yukim vows to defeat Gon herself, tasking Sid with dealing with Garter. Following this, Sid departs, and the scene shifts to a bustling downtown market, where Sid and Skull Poe are drawn to numerous local vendors hosting extraordinary sales. Sid deduces that these sales are a reaction to Alpha's aggressive marketing, which has alienated local businesses. Musing on the chaos, Sid contemplates leveraging the situation to his advantage with his accumulated wealth, considering appointing Alpha and others as managers. A subsequent incident in a shop leads to the discovery of a new MCA-issued banknote, triggering a discussion on its poor quality compared to the old currency. Sid recounts a childhood incident where his attempt to forge a yen note was thwarted, shattering his early ambitions. This memory spurs an idea to exploit the current currency shift for profit. Later, Sid shares his plan with Yukim to capitalize on the public's shift from coins to paper money by creating counterfeit currency, though Yukim is initially dubious. 
She suggests using the fake notes to sow distrust, then exchanging them for coins at the bank. Sid, still processing the plan, leaves disheartened after Yukim agrees. Elsewhere, Sid encounters Delta, who invites him to join her bandit hunts, but he insists she first complete Alpha's tasks. Despite his reluctance, Delta's persistence wins, and Sid agrees to join her next time. Meanwhile, Garter and Gon discuss their waning influence and Gon proposes deploying assassins to eliminate their rivals. During a hunting trip, Delta overshadows Sid, leaving little for him to do. The appearance of her brother, Zabra, serving the great wolf Gon, leads to a tragic turn when Delta kills Zabra, indifferent to family ties. She then offers Sid a chance to lead their group by defeating her father, an offer he declines. News of Zabra's death reaches Garter and Gon, leading to a debate over their strategy to address the ongoing conflicts, with Garter suggesting a tactical withdrawal. Gon, preferring a more aggressive approach, contemplates targeting Mitsugi as Garter exits the scene. Peering through his glasses with a solemn expression, he prepares for an impending confrontation at Mitsugi's headquarters. At Mitsugi's main office, Gamma updates Alpha on the company's resilience despite targeted attacks on their transport vehicles. Despite the major corporate alliance's efforts, Mitsugi maintains its economic dominance. Gamma foresees a self-destructive end for the alliance without strategic insight. Alpha, aware of the intricacies of such power plays, cautions Gamma against placing too much trust in the shadowy elements, suggesting a need for balance. Gamma concurs, advocating for subtler tactics to preserve their standing. Alpha's meeting with impatient guests is interrupted by Nu. Alpha instructs Nu in handling the situation with a blend of sternness and wit. Gamma offers to take over, but after a tense pause, Alpha insists on Nu's handling, revealing underlying concerns. Reluctantly, Alpha agrees to Gamma's request, with Omega and Chi joining in with evident reluctance. The unannounced visitors infiltrate Mitsugi's premises, casually remarking on the security or lack thereof. Their goal is to locate the manager, Luna, who boldly confronts them. Meanwhile, Omega and Chi engage with two of the intruders, leaving Leaf One to face off against Gamma. Gamma remains calm despite Leaf One's skepticism, which grows when his attack only causes minor discomfort. This encounter escalates as Gamma reveals her less refined sword fighting skills, causing significant damage and accidentally creating a hole in the wall. During the ensuing chaos, Gamma acknowledges Leaf One's tactical prowess. Shai and Omega, having won their own battles, come to assist Gamma. In an unexpected turn, Gamma's magically enhanced sword strike fatally wounds Leaf One, resulting in an explosion and leaving Alpha exasperated. Back at headquarters, Garter reports the loss of the Clover members and the potential leaks in their alliance with Mitsugi. Gon, undeterred, instructs Garter to handle dissenters, contemplating the use of the Diablo cult as an alternative power source. Amidst the unfolding drama, Alexia spars with Sid, showing marked improvement. After their training session, she shares her aspirations for more power to actively shape her life. Sid, adopting his alter ego John Smith, contemplates these events over sake at a noodle shop. Yukim reveals to John Smith the details of their counterfeiting operation, including the use of an abandoned coal mine for printing. John Smith, demonstrating his keen eye, distinguishes between the genuine and counterfeit notes. Yukim and John Smith then plan to counter Gon's moves, with Yukim seeking retribution for past grievances. John Smith cautions her on the perils of seeking revenge, hinting at irreversible consequences. Yukim, having already paid a significant price, is eager to reap the rewards of their meticulous plan. As Shadow Garden identifies counterfeit notes circulating in Mitsugi stores, Gamma reports this to Alpha, raising concerns about a potential credit crisis if MCA remains unaware. Alpha assigns Gamma the task of informing MCA and identifying the distribution source of the counterfeits. This development aligns perfectly with the objectives of the super secret agent. The discovery of the fake currency prompts the major corporate alliance to involve Garter, who is instructed to report to Gon. Gon, worried about their financial resources, directs Garter to independently investigate the source of the disturbance. Gon's true intention is to segregate the cult's capital from NCA assets, fearing the premature spread of counterfeit notes might endanger the cult's wealth. In Lawless City at dusk, Operative 664, 665, and 666 target a train suspected of carrying contraband, including the counterfeit MCA banknotes. 664, leading the mission, criticizes 666 for her dubious decisions and stresses the importance of following orders. Despite 665's casual demeanor, the team infiltrates the train, finding it unexpectedly devoid of passengers and guards. However, their mission takes an unforeseen turn when they are caught in a trap set by a suave gentleman controlling a web of magic reinforced wires, John Smith. Despite their efforts to escape, the operatives are effortlessly overpowered by John Smith. Recognizing their premature arrival, he swiftly ejects them from the train, effectively foiling their operation. On the ground, 666 is ready to retaliate, but 664 orders a strategic retreat, acknowledging their underestimation of the adversary. Back at Mitsugi, Alpha is informed of the operation's failure and is shocked to learn that her top agents were defeated by the enigmatic John Smith. Gamma is puzzled by this new adversary, suspecting connections to the cult of Diablo or Lawless City. Amidst the speculation, 666 interjects, emphasizing John Smith's extraordinary strength. Alpha and Gamma are left in a state of disbelief and concern. Additionally, Gamma shares with Alpha that Zeta has been dispatched on a separate mission, but there has been no communication from her. Alpha expresses apprehension about Zeta's silence, hoping it indicates progress rather than complications. 
the strain of managing such critical operations, coupled with the uncertainty surrounding Zeta's mission and John Smith's sudden emergence, adds to the escalating tension and complexity of their situation. However, she also has a role in seeking out the target Alpha, which makes it evident that she's exhausted from all the conflict and eagerly awaits a period of peace for a much-needed respite. The cult has been troublesome, and Gamma grows worried. Alpha dispatches Delta to confront a mysterious individual named John Smith, armed with the Anthrope for the pursuit. As he leisurely flips through his notebook during a train ride leaving Lawless City, John Smith notices Delta, who has been secretly following the train. He readies himself for her imminent assault, known for her ferocious hunting methods. Delta bursts in, launching an attack on John, who skillfully evades using his magical strings. The strings serve as a minor distraction, which he knows Delta can sidestep. He then focuses entirely on the confrontation, stowing his notebook. Delta's roar is so powerful it damages the train. Seizing the opportunity, John Smith uses the debris to overpower Delta, gaining the upper hand. Just as he's about to delve into a sinister monologue, Delta recognizes his scent and relents, realizing she's in the presence of her master. Delta's demeanor shifts to playful and submissive, and she recognizes him as Shadow. Disappointed at the missed chance, Sid decides not to delay any further and carries her to a different cabin. Sid raises an eyebrow at Delta's unexpected appearance. She reveals that Alpha sent her to track down John Smith, leading to a dramatic realization, John Smith is Sid, a classic espionage confusion. To prevent a risky report to Alpha, Sid fabricates a story of a confidential mission. Delta, amused, offers to join him, adding a light-hearted jest to the spy intrigue. However, Sid insists the mission is a solo endeavor, hinting at its critical nature and potential failure should she report back to Alpha. Delta, torn between her loyalty and curiosity, faces a dilemma. Sid, asserting his authority, assures her of his control and entrusts her with an enticingly rewarding mission of her own. He draws her attention to Lawless City, directing her to pursue Juggernaut at his Black Tower. As she departs, motivated and focused, Sid, overwhelmed by the evolving scenario, can't help but find humor in the situation. The next day, Gamma brings a grim update about the train battle site and the discovery of Delta's broken bell ornament. Alpha, usually composed, is visibly shaken, realizing Delta's dedication to her missions and wouldn't disappear without reason. She orders an intensified search, even if it's just to find Delta's presumed deceased body. Alpha's frustration manifests as she quietly expresses her anger by shattering a window. As the search continues, Gamma shares more disturbing news, the influx of counterfeit bills outstripping the assets available for their redemption. Alpha deduces that John Smith is behind the economic chaos, strategically distracting major corporate players and Mitsugi in their trade conflict, aiming to seize the remnants for himself. This revelation astounds Gamma, who grasps the extent of John Smith's ambition. Meanwhile, Alpha's anger intensifies, her mana manifesting as a blue flame, as she ponders over the intricate deceit. In the balmy atmosphere of G's office, Gon conducts a meeting with two cult agents, discussing the organization's concerns regarding the credit collapse and significant losses. Amidst the serious conversation, one agent jests about Gon's personal connections, but the mood darkens abruptly when Gon swiftly beheads the joking agent, leaving the other shaken. Gon calmly inquires about John Smith's role in the economic turmoil, with the surviving agent confirming their suspicions of his involvement. Moreover, he successfully countered their efforts to disrupt his counterfeit scheme. Unfazed by this revelation, Gon issues a strategic directive to Garter, to establish inspection checkpoints at every exit from the capital. However, Garter, concerned about the potential backlash from royals and night orders, attempts to reason with Gon. Demonstrating his uncompromising determination, Gon abruptly eliminates the remaining agent, underscoring the seriousness of the matter. This leaves Garter with no alternative but to adhere to Gon's orders, albeit with trepidation. As Iris returns from her training, she stumbles upon Alexia, engrossed in a mountain of books within the castle. Baffled by her sister's sudden scholarly inclination, Iris inquires about this unexpected interest, especially since the academy was still being rebuilt. Alexia, surrounded by a literary fortress reminiscent of medieval times, explains she's researching the palace archives to acquire specialized knowledge in various social disciplines. Intrigued, Iris asks if Alexia is considering a shift to academic pursuits. Alexia, however, discloses a more profound reason, to enhance her intellectual acuity. She believes that comprehending social intricacies will lend purpose to her swordsmanship. Reflecting on recent events, Alexia realizes that mindless sword fighting is futile and alienating. Her insight is striking, to use her sword with intention, she must earn her place in this significant role, even if it means venturing into fields unrelated to combat. Amidst this revelation, Iris suddenly departs, leaving Alexia puzzled by her abrupt exit. Meanwhile, in Sid's dorm room, Beta meticulously explains the repercussions of the counterfeit bills on the capital's economy. Despite the warmth from a fire pot, Shadow shivers as he notes the larger context. Beta points out how Garter's checkpoints exacerbate the economic crisis and might provoke a reaction from the royal family. When Beta pauses to check if Shadow is following along, he affirms his commitment to note-taking, considering its future impact. However, as Beta delves into the complexities of inflation, Shadow, seemingly preoccupied, mutters about not comprehending something. Beta then offers to restart the analysis. But Shadow, citing other engagements, excuses himself. Before departing, Beta inquires if he's documented everything. Shadow, adhering to Shadow Garden protocols, reveals his notes in an intricate, unrecognized language. 
In a surprising turn, Shadow boasts of having developed a unique coding method using five languages, entrusting Beta with a page to decipher, offering her a peek into the enigmatic wisdom encoded in his notes. The room thrums with the complexities of concealed knowledge, leaving Beta both awestruck and captivated by the depths of Shadow's secretive universe. In a separate scenario, John Smith meticulously reviews his notes from Beta's briefing. Matsu alerts him of their nearing approach to the MCA checkpoint, prompting John to conceal his notebook. At the checkpoint, a tense atmosphere prevails among the MCA members, who debate the practicality of its enforcement. A senior colleague reminds a junior member of their directive, stop the train or fabricate an accident. Frustration simmers as they contemplate Garter's seemingly trivial role, while the senior member voices apprehension about Garter's allegiances. As the train nears, the checkpoint is effortlessly destroyed, allowing the train to pass unobstructed. The senior member, fearing retribution from unseen forces, hopes to vanish unnoticed. Atop the train, John Smith spots a shadowy figure, greeted unexpectedly by Alpha. Their meeting takes an unforeseen twist as Alpha abruptly bids farewell. Refusing to play along, John Smith counters, catching her off guard. Alpha, recognizing her adversary, is shattered, demanding an explanation. John Smith, now under a new identity, declares his old self abandoned, bewildering Alpha. She presses for details about Delta's whereabouts, and he candidly admits sending her away. Frustrated by his evasiveness, Alpha, charged with magical energy, demands clarity. Expressing her struggles to comprehend his actions, Alpha voices her willingness to support him, reminiscing on how he once saved her. John Smith deflects, assuring her that time will reveal the rationale behind his decisions. Unwavering, Alpha vows not to hold him back any longer, unleashing her newfound powers and setting the stage for a magical duel transcending boundaries. In a spellbinding showdown, Sid, as John Smith, faces off with Alpha. His remarkable maneuvers counter Alpha's attacks, highlighting the drawbacks of her missed transformation, like intense blowback. Sid's tiger kung fu stance, shattering train windows and deploying an iron palm, leaves Alpha futilely reaching out as she lands on the tracks, imploring her mentor not to depart. Elsewhere, at an abandoned mine, Yukuma unveils her grand scheme to John Smith, draining the major corporate alliance of gold through counterfeiting, holding authentic banknotes to expose MCA's insolvency, instigating a credit crisis, and taking down Mitsugi. As chaos reigns, Yukim plans her discreet departure. John Smith, referencing Beta's report, concurs, noting the inflationary impact and state-level responses. Impressed, Yukim and John Smith share a moment of mutual admiration. On a train from their secret hideout, Yukim delves into her past, narrating a tale of love and war involving her spirit Fox Clan's alliance with the Great Wolves and her betrothal to Gon. The union brought joy, but inter-clan conflict devastated their village. Gon sought power through red pills, opposed by Yukim's mother, uniting the village in faith. This tragedy shaped Yukim's journey, leading to her becoming the White Tower's queen in Lawless City. Her goal, to topple Gon and end his reign. Sid, distracted, contemplates parallels with another's plight, while Yukim concludes her story, entrusting John Smith to await her victorious return. Meanwhile, in Lawless City, Delta howls, witnessing the inferno where the Black Tower once stood. But at Mitsugoshi, everyone felt most depressing time, because of Shadow left them, and at the same time, the MCA banks were closing in, so people began to believe about the rumors of the fake notes. At that time Alpha has also lost her confidence since Sid left her. And their gamma reports are about the credit collapse and also that Mitsugoshi won't survive at this rate even with their entire fortune. But Alpha doesn't care anymore and tells Shadow had left them alone. Their new came in with the report that the Cult of Diablos was planning to circulate the fake counterfeit bill in order to bankrupt Mitsugoshi. And with that Alpha realized that Shadow knew this ahead of time, so he made his own counterfeit bills first and entered the market before the cult could make a move, there. Beta arrives with the message that Ada deciphered Shadow's secret message, it was telling them about his plan, he told them the location of the gold coins he made from fake notes. And the girls were relieved that Shadow had never betrayed them, he made this move to counter the cult and save Mitsugoshi, but then they remembered about Delta. So Alpha calls Delta out as she knew she had returned, seeing her, they understood that Shadow had sent her away on a secret mission, as for Sid. He was having a good time after Yuki told him that she didn't want the money, but all the gold coins had vanished from his cave. And two of Yuki's girls came in to tell him that they had lost contact with Yuki, so Getan must have did something to her, so John was furious because he thought Getan stole all of the money. But Getan was being beaten to pulp by Yuki, she considered killing him but, remembering how she loved him she left him alive. But Getan couldn't take that insult and took the blood pill of the cult to become powerful, he had Yuki in his hands, but John comes in time and starts beating the crap out of him. Getan tried to take all the pills but John gives him a fatalities like Mortal Kombat player, he asks Getan again and again about the money but dude doesn't know anything. So John beats him to his death, but before dying he tells John to take care of Yuki, so for his last wish he agreed. There John heals Yuki with his power and she remembered that he was the one who saved her when Getan nearly killed her in the past, after that. 
NCA is finished and Yuki returned and saw that their money was gone, but their alpha comes and tells Yuki about Shadow Garden and Mitsugoshi and their leader is Shadow. She tells her that Getan was led astray by the cult of Diablos, so to beat the cult alpha proposes to Yuki that she could join Shadow Garden and Yuki decided to accept her offer, after that. Sid was looking for something with Delta when he tells her that he's going on a journey alone because Sid thinks the girls will be angry after he made this whole betraying plan. So he wants to keep some distance for now to discover a secret technique and leaves from there, and right then, Delta found something buried and calls out to Sid. But Sid had already left on his journey, and left them alone. Sid left six tickets to the Mitsugoshi Hot Springs for his friends to go on a date. So both Ba and Hiro runs to Mitsugoshi to ask the girl employees out on a date, but new becomes dangerous because these were the VIP tickets given to Sid. So Pun and Myro clears it up that Sid gave it to them to ask girls out on a date, and New Thought Shadow wants to give them a secret message through this group date. So an emergency meeting was called and their alpha asked Eda about this hot springs, that hot springs brought back some memories which she just showed everyone. It was in the past when they were hunting down the cult members, there they learned about the dragon tears from a soon to die person, and Shadow thought the dragon tears were a valuable ancient item. So he told all the girls to dig up the hole to find it, after three days, they found a hot spring, where Miss Tugoshi has recently built their hot spring park. So all of them thought Shadow wants to give them a secret mission regarding this Dragon Tears, but only three girls could go on this date. So a fight breaks out between Seven Shadow and they chose the winner with stone, paper, scissors, the winners were Zeta, Beta, and Delta, but Sid wasn't there on their meetup point. Which ticked them off, Sopo and Hiro just made up that Sid was running late but he would definitely get here, that answer sufficed them for now. But other girls also didn't stay behind and used this excuse to relax at Hot Springs, but they were still concerned that Sid didn't arrive to relay his secret message. So Alpha believed that Sid must have planned this to have all Miss Tugoshi relax for a bit in exchange for this whole counterfeit ruckus that happened. Then, afterwards, Zeta remembers the urban legend of the Dragon Tears, the story starts with a princess who rescued and raised a baby dragon, the days were going peacefully until a war broke out. The dragon fought on front lines to protect princess, but when dragon returned, the capital was in shambles and the princess was on the verge of death. With that lifeless body a tear drops out and seeing that dragon also began to cry, it caused a massive flood, but the flood was reached with life essence that saved the princess. And when she woke up the dragon was nowhere to be found, and that is how the story ends. But their pen Myro were trying sneak a peek at girls but Etta had already made self-defense for these type of guys, there, Etta caught a magical reading from underground. So Zeta recalls that it was Princess Tears according to legends, so Etta turns to self-proclaimed elf Princess Beta. Etta did some emotional damage to Beta by mocking her that Shadow doesn't like a rag like her, so Delta also joined in on the fun and Beta's tears actually worked out in the end. It awakens the soul of the dragon which was still loyal to Princess, so all the girls fought the soul, and Alpha ends the fight with her signature attack. She freed the dragon's soul and the dragon still says his final goodbye to the princess before leaving this world. It was a fun time for the girls had in a while, but Sid ended up in the Oriana Kingdom following his journey for finding his reason to move forward to become an eminence in shadow. But the Oriana Kingdom was in distress because of war and soldiers were forcefully taking supplies from citizens, even in Keeper Mary was a victim, there. Two girls of Shadow Garden were also there on a mission with Rose. Rose was broken to see her ruined kingdom and she blamed herself for being weak even after joining the Shadow Garden to become powerful in order to save her kingdom. They came to Oriana Kingdom on a mission and met the leader of that mission at night, code number 559, and she specifically requested for Rose to join this mission. So Rose thought it must be because this used to be her home, but there were other reasons as well, 559 knew Rose got her powers directly from Shadow himself, unlike others, aside from Seven Shadows. 559 and Rose were the only ones who got their powers from Shadow himself, but Rose was still weaker than 559, then their attention is drawn to the Kudos, and the other's first child of the cult. They used the same card that one of the cult's key members had used in Sanctuary, and even brought out Rose's mother to unlock the seal to retrieve a ring. The key was on sight so 559 was about to kill everyone including the queen, but Rose steps in to save her mother, 559 was a loyalist to Shadow. And for the betrayal she was set to kill Rose and everyone, but she fails and Rose returned back home with her mother. Yet the cult was still holding the strings of Rose to control her and Gamma got the full report of it. But she was relaxed because their plan was going exactly as Shadow had planned and in the upcoming time Perv Asshart will make his move to take the throne. There was a faction that is against Perv Asshart and Sid thought of stepping into this Game of Thrones to look like a real eminence in Shadow, but between his daydreams. 
Those ruffian soldiers came in to loot again, they threatened Mary that they would force themselves on her if she won't pay money, so Sid stood up to protect her and pretend to be weak. Sid was beaten to pulp, yet he apologized to Mary that he wasn't able to protect her money. So she tells Sid that she worked as a prostitute in the lawless city and was saved by Shadow, she endured that tough time, so Mary was sure she would go through this tough time as well. She insisted not to take any money from Sid as he saved her from those goons, but Sid knew what will happen to Mary so he found those three idiots and gave them an instant death. Mary was concerned since she can't even stock up supplies or pay the rent, so she thought of selling her body again to earn some money. But there she saw Shadow found her again and left bag of gold coins for her. Aside from her, all the girls of Shadow Garden were near death as they fought for three days straight, but their Shadow healed 559, and she killed the last enemy, the first child of the cult. 559 is a member of Shadow Fan Club, but she puts it aside and quickly gives a report of 666 betrayal. But Rose's companion were still supporting Rose's decisions because she only means to save her mother from 559, their Shadow saw the flyer of Rose's marriage announcement which ticked him off. 559 thought Shadow wanted to punish the backstabber Rose himself, but actually if Rose were to get married it would hinder Sid's plan for his future. So he wanted Rose to be the next ruler of the Oriana Kingdom, but if this marriage happens per Vassart would become the new king, so Sid was pretty bent on getting Rose back to her track. But away from there, Lambda brought a few of the Shadow Garden girls undercover, where she meets Omega and she, they wanted her to stay but Lambda tells them about Rose's betrayal. So she was planning to take responsibility since she was her instructor when she arrived at Shadow Garden. But that won't be necessary because not even Seven Shadows can do anything about this situation, Lambda understood right away that Shadow has taken over this case himself. She was a little worried about this, but she couldn't do anything because Shadow was now involved in this case, they think Shadow is going to kill Rose, but nope, Sid doesn't really plan to kill Rose. He just doesn't want Rose to marry that perv asshart because of his future plan includes Rose, so he wanted to sneak into Royal Castle without wearing his Shadow hoodie. But there Epizalan calls him out from the back, her timing was perfect and she took Sid into the castle on her identity, Epsilon is an artist and artists are respected in Oriana Kingdom. So she brought Sid inside as his apprentice, she was getting all touchy to Sid. But Sid knew her giant racks her nothing but slime that she is controlling with her magic to move according to her will, Epsilon is genius to hide her flat chest. But regardless she's a famous pianist, so getting this chance Epsilon tells Sid that her spies are everywhere, but they are interrupted by Perv Asshart. So Epsilon relaxed and gets into her act as a pianist and tells him she is going to perform her new music for Rose, but Parashart just made up that Rose wasn't feeling well so she's going to rest. It was clear as day he was spouting all lies, but Perv was interested in Sid, so Epsilon told him Sid is her apprentice, but no one was allowed in without a pass. So Epsilon thought of leaving with Sid, but Perv doesn't mind letting Sid stay as long as Sid can perform a play for them. Sid is the one who taught piano to Epsilon, and they simply asked the master to play for them, but one thing Sid noticed was that while commoners were living their lives on the streets, nobles were still living as leisurely as usual, then he played his signature tune, Moonlight Sonata, which shocked the circuits out of everyone. And Sid took this opportunity to steal a few of the jewels, so Perv Asshart tried to get close, but Epsilon prevents them because they were trying to get Sid into the music industry. So while they were busy chatting, Sid saw a ring was in Perv Asshart pocket, so he used the string to steal it from him, now that Sid had one key, he wanted to take a tour of the castle. So a little maid volunteers to guide him, she took Sid out on a royal garden for the tour and got clingy while praising him non-stop. Margaret even heard that many of the nobles wanted to hire him for a fairly large annual salary, but she personally suggests her own family for employment if Sid was interested. She was clearly into Sid so he goes with Epsilon decision to hold back from getting into spotlight. But aside from that Margaret was Rose's personal maid so Sid asked her about Rose and she got depressed, she used to look up to her, but the moment she killed her father, the king, she blames her for the kingdom's situation, so she refused to tell Sid about Rose, but she was really into Sid, so she told him where she was locked up. And Sid slips out of there while she's in her daydream, but a fatso blocked his way, he was a guard who had a crush on Margaret. He challenges Sid to a fight because he was jealous that Margaret was giving her attention to Sid. This fatso was really in a delusional world that Margaret liked him judging by her reactions when she sees him, so Sid leaves him in his delusional world and slips out again, as for Rose. She knew turning a traitor would throw her kingdom into a war with Shadow Garden and Cult of Diablos, but there Sid climbs all the way up to her room. And finally she was reunited with Sid after a long time, Sid tries to make her remember her conviction she showed that day, when she killed her father, which pains Rose even more. Rose has given up on her dream and herself, so Sid makes her remember that she become a dark knight despite she was looked down upon, 
she was chasing down her dream, and for that, the people made fun of her dream. And despite that she still became a dark knight and now she is giving up all of a sudden, but Rose had completely given up and told Sid to forget about her, that was all what she said. And their ass heart comes as he got a report Rose was talking with someone, he tried to show his authority and threatened Rose to behave since her mother's life is in his hands. But the mother she wants to protect is getting ready to make her knight colorful, such a bitch, anyways Sid moves out his another plan, but he still doesn't know the ring he stole is the key. As for Epsilon, she was with Victoria, and got a report on Rose, this mission was a failure because they didn't give them the information that Rose's mother was involved in this matter. But Shadow has already taken this matter in his hands and met Rose today, but Epsilon was confused thinking that Sid didn't do anything to Rose. So she guessed that Sid must have had some plans that he left Rose alive, but what was more concerning was the ring Asshart had which could trigger to activate a big explosion. But they didn't know the ring is already with Sid, their Sid comes in after a bath and both girls gets on to serve him, he told them his plan to deal with Rose is already half completed. Which will derail their plan with the cult, the cult was closely working with Perv Asshart and he Asshart was happy that he could screw up Shadow Garden with that ring, their Reina. Ross's mother comes in her lingerie to sleep with Perv Asshart. So now everything makes sense, how the king was hypnotized and Rose had to kill her father to free him. It's all because Reyna was cheating with Perv Asshart all along and even gave Rose to Perv Asshart for marriage, just so she could continue her sexual relationship with Asshart. Zeta discovered a secret base of the cult, and the item she was looking for was already gone, on Sid's side. The ceremony before marriage was going smoothly, Epsilon was a musician hired by royals for marriage, and Sid was enjoying everything for free as an apprentice, there Margaret once again found Sid. But Sid knew Perv Asshat was threatening Rose with her mother's life, so the plan was simple, save the hostage to get Rose back on track, but Margaret started sucking up to Sid again. She was worried about Sid because a creepy guard was roaming around castle lately, she got some tight grip that even Sid had difficulty removing his hands. Margaret believes Epsilon was keeping Sid under her control and won't let him shine on the world stage of music, Margaret started to curse Epsilon, but Epsilon heard everything. And it was going to turn into a cat fight, so Sid slips out of there, without his clothes, and performed in a half-naked state, for which Margaret was scolded. After that, Epsilon tells Sid about the Black Rose that keeps the Oriana Kingdom in check, and it had an impact that every noble started to like arts and left violence behind, but even so. Sid is interested to see this abomination, Sid thought it's an organization, but Epsilon was referring to a monster, but for now, rescuing the queen comes first. But Sid discovered the queen was having an affair with her asshat. Sid overheard their conversation that they were planning to kill Rose after marriage and this information was enough for Sid to leave before those two got into bed, it was an unusual turn of events. So Sid decided to let Rose see the truth with her own eyes to get her into rage mode. Rose was treated coldly by Margaret and her servants, and she knew why, but she thought of enduring all of this to save her mother, and their shadow gets in, and Rose thought he was here to kill her. But he told Rose to follow and to see the truth, Shadow took Rose to her mother's room, and she heard her mother's moans. And she found out that her mother was having sexual relationship with Perv Asshart, and she heard the truth that her mother drugged her father and because of that. She had to kill her father to free him from this life, poor girl threw up because she blamed herself for killing her father, but in the end, it was her own mother who actually killed her father. The king, Rose wasn't able to take in this truth and passed out, so Shadow brought her back to her room, then, as she woke up. She just got snapped from all the messed up things that kept happening to her, but there she heard the piano play, and it was Sid who came to her again. She was literally so broken that she didn't realize Sid was playing the same tune Shadow plays, Rose wanted to run away with Sid somewhere far away. But Sid made her understand to prioritize something that she wants and divide things into two, something that matters, and something that doesn't, it will clear out her visions to what she should do. Right there Sid leaves and left the ring behind, Sid thought he lost it, he wanted to take a bath, but Epsilon comes in to help Sid in bath, Sid told everything that happened. And after three days the marriage is about to happen, and that day Sid thinks Rose will make her decision, but citizens were against this marriage and yet Per Vashat was happy because he had the key. He reveals that he used the queen to get this ring, but before that king passed on the ownership of this ring to Rose, and unless Per Vashat sleeps with a royal blood he couldn't use this ring. But his dreams were shattered because the ring was gone, that moron tried several times, but the ring was gone and it took a while for him to realize that. But it was his wedding day and the stage was set, the bride was set and she came down the aisle. everything was going as planned and Reyna wasn't interested and was dozing off. There Rose refused to marry and rejected Perv Asshat, she accused Perv Asshat of betraying the king and defiling the queen in order to take the throne. Rose only loved Sid and thought Sid left that ring for her as a token of his love, she wore it as a sign she belongs to Sid, but wearing it triggered a recording of the king. 
The king recorded this to tell this to his citizens, he sensed he felt he was being drugged by his food every day, king told his wife Reina to change his course of food, but nothing happened. So before king lost his mind, he recorded this to let the truth about his death be revealed, king even mentioned that Perv Ashat was supported by an organization. Perv Ashat was an adopted son yet he got in the center of Oriana government, all because of that organization, but to save this kingdom, king left his throne to his daughter Rose. This recording was enough to destroy Perv Ashat, because nobles always tend to drag down someone higher than them, but Rose personally wanted to kill that traitor by her hands. But his head flew off in a flash and rolled down in front of Reyna, and even she got her head cleaned off, honestly, I wanted that bitch to suffer more, but she got killed and that's that. And the one who did this was the Knight Beyond Man, ninth seat of the round table of Cult of Diabolo, and he used a controller to summon the Black Rose through that ring, it was a Ragnarok, who destroyed half of the city in a single blow, but when he tried to kill Rose, Ragnarok lost its arm because Rose was protected by Shadow. Alpha hears that Black Rose has been set off, and she believes that the destruction that comes before creation has begun. Alpha can send a ship to Oriana if they want to, but it's not likely that they'll get there in time. Omega tells Oriana not to worry because Shadow is there, and then we see Ragnarok call some monsters to attack Oriana. Miriam is shocked to see that Shadow hurt Ragnarok, and he asks Shadow who he is. Shadow introduces himself, and in the marriage hall, the other members of Shadow Garden do the same. Then everyone split up to fight the monsters, and Shadow told Rose that she should also get going because she had things she needed to do. Rose left after hearing this, and Shadow went to fight Ragnarok and Rid, who thinks he is exaggerating. And Epsilon went there to face Morid. They told him they were going to kill him, but they needed to make sure of something first. Morid hits Epsilon with an invisible sword, but Epsilon avoids it. This makes Epsilon think that this is why Morid is called the Knight Beyond Men. Morid says that his fencing is something that normal people can't see, and he's impressed that Epsilon was able to avoid it. Epsilon says that all he is doing is using the Invisible Blade, an old elven artifact that makes a sword that can't be seen. Beta says that the cult of Diablo is just like them when they brag about something they stole. She also says that even Diablo's armor and cape are artifacts. In response, she calls him a coward, which makes Miri angry. Epsilon then says that an elven swordsmith risked his life to make that blade, and they will now take it back. When Morgard gets angry, he attacks them, but Epsilon beats him. She answered his attack with one of her own, and Morgard wonders if she is also using an artifact. Beta says that the wisdom they were given is stronger than any artifact, and they say that again. Mrid is also going to teach them what he knows. Mrid tells them they'll feel bad about what they did and gets ready to attack them later. Once Rose has killed the last monster in the castle, she sees that there are still a lot of them in town. Shadow Garden is taking care of them, so she lets them handle this. After that, Margaret finds Rose and tries to say sorry, but Rose cuts her off before she can finish. She tells Margaret to take everyone to the safe cellar they have under the castle gardens. She says she will call together the knights and save the people who are in trouble. Margaret says she will do what she says, and she calls Rose, Queen. Then we see Shadow and Ragnarok fighting, and Ragnarok casts his magic all over the place to attack Shadow. Shadow is able to avoid all of its attacks, though. It seems to him that Ragnarok has some crazy magic power. He uses his threads to catch the monster and tells it that he rules the skies. Rose. Then talk to the Shadow Garden members, and ask her after they leave the knights. If they believe those guys with the monsters, Rose tells them they can if they can show them their worth, which they can do by dying. Then she tells them to focus on the evacuation, and the knights leave Rose. After seeing Shadow fight Ragnarok, she asks Mori where Mori is. Mori falls next to her from the sky, and Beta and Epsilon follow him. Beta tells Mori that it was stupid of him to rely on his toys to fight them. Mori can't believe he lost to two little girls. Mrid says that this isn't over yet because he has Ragnarok with him and can kill them in an instant. Beta tells him that the instant he's talking about is still a long way off, and Epsilon asks him to confirm some things for them while they wait. Morid asks them right away what they want to know, and Beta tells him what they want to know. He tells the Black Rose, the Magical Beasts, and the Cult Mrid that he will never tell them. That, and Beta says that this shouldn't be a problem because he thinks Ragnarok will kill them. Anyway, Morid agrees to tell them what they want to know because he knows they are going to die soon. He tells them that this is not their world. There are many other worlds out there. The girls ask if he's talking about space and other planets. Morid tells them that he's talking about different dimensions, which they call, realms. He says there are different kinds of realms, like a realm of poison, a realm of fire, and a realm of ice. Each of these realms goes around a single point, and their world goes around it too. They have no idea what's in the middle point, but because the worlds are spinning around it, sometimes they collide, which links the different worlds together. He says he will give you an example of what happens when the worlds collide. He also says that they studied the ancient layers of their planet and learned that way back when. This world didn't have magic. When their world crashed into another realm, magic flowed into it from that realm. 
The biosphere changed because of this, and the dragons could no longer live. Only the humanoid races made it through this disaster alive, but this theory still has some questions. It's possible that the hum came to this world from another realm, just like magic and its creatures. People are the only species with this much intelligence that has been able to thrive, and he says that there are still unanswered questions about them. This could be because they came from another world. Many things have come into this world from other realms over the years, but some have also gone back to those other realms. He says that there was once a country on an island called Atlantis that was never found. It probably went to another realm, and this one and the other realms are affecting each other. The girls also wonder if Diablo came from another realm. Mori says that Diablos was made in their world, but the creature that was the inspiration for the demon Diablos came from another realm. Diablos taught them many things, which is why they call that world the first realm. He says that by now they should have understood. What that Sky High Rose really is Beta says that it's a fake gate to another world, and Grid says that Oriana accidentally opened it one time, which is how they killed the Volton soldiers. It wasn't easy for the kingdom to get out, though. Magical creatures kept pouring out of the gate, killing any humans that got in their way. Oriana was saved by the cult. It seemed right for Oriana to repay them by locking the gate. The cult wanted Rose because her royal blood was very high in magic. She should have been given to the cult when she was a baby, but her father refused. This is what caused everything. Miri says that after they destroy Oriana, they will try to build a better kingdom, but Rose says she won't. Allow him to do that. Mrid says that what she thinks doesn't matter because Ragnarok is going to destroy her soon, and then parts of Ragnarok fall on her. After that, Shadow uses his threads to cut Ragnarok into tiny pieces. Mordor can't believe what he's seeing. He thinks this is impossible because Ragnarok is the most valuable thing in all dimensions. 559 tells Beta and Epsilon that all the monsters in the capital have been killed. Gamzee gives her more instructions, and Grid tells him that Ragnarok can't be defeated, which makes him think he's dreaming. He moves toward Ragnarok's fallen arm and then joins with it in some way. He goes to fight Shadow and tries to attack him, but Shadow's attack hits him back. Don't land on Shadow Shadow or have any effect on them. Shadow Shadow says that Morgard is even less smart than beasts because beasts can tell when they've been matched up. Then he punches Grime up into the sky. Grime tries to shoot Shadow with some beams, but Shadow avoids them. All of them, Shadow then punches Mori into space and says that the god sent lightning from the sky a long time ago to punish Earth. Many people were interested in this power and wanted it for themselves. It took humans years of work, but they finally got this power, which came in the form of nuclear bombs. Shadow says that seeing space has reminded him of his goal and what he needs to beat. He then extends his hand over the whole Earth. The light from his attack can be seen by everyone on Earth because it is powered by his mana. Everyone in Shadow Garden knows that this must be their lord's power, and as soon as the light goes out, Shadow begins to fall on Oriana. Then we see that something like a black hole has appeared over Oriana and is squeezing everything inside. Shadow is also sucked into the hole, and we are then taken to AOS Tokyo after the end of the world. We see Akane Nishino, the girl we saw in the first episode of Season 1. She is on her way to save her friends and trying to get somewhere. She thinks of a boy she hated who was just like everyone else. Looking at the moon now makes her remember that day and that boy. Akin then learns that her friends have died, and she says that she already knew this because no one they take away lives even a day. After that, she tries to go back, but the two men who took her hostage attack her along the way. This time, they are cyborgs. They take her away again after knocking her out. She wakes up in the same warehouse where she was locked up before. One of the men tells her that Kane shouldn't go out by herself, even if she is the great savior, because she might meet some bad people. He says that their client wants her to stay alive and that she seems to have lost a lot of friends. The second man then tries to kill Ain, but the first man tells him not to. Both of them have lost their memories because someone messed with their brains, and the big man starts to think of the stylish bandit slayer. Ain tries to kill him, but Shadow breaks through the warehouse roof and easily kills the big man inside. It's the other man who asks Shadow who he is. Shadow tells him and pulls out the other man as well. Thanks for watching the whole show. How was the video? We hope it was good. If so, please check these videos. Also, please comment down your thoughts and your suggestions for future videos. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing now to show the support to our channel. We hope to see you soon with another video right in this channel. Have a nice day.